Greetings. Today is the second Sunday in Lent, the 25th of February of 2024. The service was pre-recorded on Friday, the 23rd. Participants include video photographer Shane Donnelly, his wife, Lori, as reader, and son Shane as acolyte, and of course, myself. If you haven't already done so, check out the church website for a link to view a professionally made video set to music of past outdoor and interior Easter decorations. Thank you for joining us. Have a good day. Welcome, boys and girls. This time of the year, Lent, before Easter, we had it on our board by the usher station last week, and maybe you have seen it elsewhere on church's marquees. One cross plus three nails equals forgiven. It has become very popular in recent years, showing up everywhere, like this baseball cap or here is someone wearing a sweatshirt. So it's become very popular, and especially at Easter time. And what does that caption mean? What does that slogan mean? It says what? One cross and three nails equal forgiven. Now that's a play on words because four is F-O-U-R. But to be forgiven is F-O-R. All right, so it's a play on words, one cross, three nails, equal, forgiven. But first of all, before we examine what that means, I'd like to bring to your attention, now, here is the Orthodox icon of the cross. And remember, the Orthodox Church keeps strong and alive ancient Christianity. And note there are one, two, three, four nails. There's four nails, not three. And the first Christians were of the belief that each hand and each foot had its own nail. Now, about a thousand years ago, in the Catholic Church and later Protestant churches, there was a switch. And they came up with the idea of three nails each hand 
and that the two feet were put together with one nail. All right, so there's a difference of opinion. Well, what does the Bible say? The Bible doesn't say. We know that Jesus was nailed to the cross and really not in his hands and not in his feet, more likely his wrist and his ankles, okay? And the nails, these are supposedly replicas of what would have been used by the Romans. So almost like a railroad nail, all right? And made out of iron and, and put through the wrist. And we can't even begin to imagine the, the pain that Jesus had to go through. Now, much later, when Christians dominated the Roman Empire, one of the first things they did when they were in power was to stop all crucifixions. They wanted no one ever again to die and suffer the way that Jesus did. All right, so that was largely done away with long ago. Now, let, let's look at what it is that we are saying. Now, it used to be in the Bible that when people did wrong things, when they said wrong things, they thought wrong things, they did things God did not want them to do, and they asked God to forgive them, they would go to the temple and they would sacrifice an animal. And the animals which were approved for sacrifice were sheep and goats, cattle and oxen, or doves and pigeons. And they were taken to the priest and they were sacrificed. And the idea is that the death of that animal and the shedding of its blood forgave us the sin. All right, so the Bible says there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. All right, so... Our Christian belief is that when Jesus died on the cross, and we call him the Lamb of God, that no animal would ever again have to die for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus did that for us. All right, so when we do wrong, and, we're, we, and we do, and we ask God to forgive us, that we go to Jesus, and we know what he did for us on the cross. His one cross and his three nails gave us forgiveness and continued to give us forgiveness and will always give us forgiveness. And we need to seek his forgiveness and ask him to help us to do better and, and to live a life that he would approve. All right, so that is what we are affirming in this caption, one cross plus three nails equals forgiven. And what I'm giving you as your gift is a cross that has that caption on it. And you can keep it as a reminder of this message. And you have a good Lent. Verses related to the hierarchy and the crucifixion. I'm reading from the New International Version Bible, the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through 15, the cleansing of the temple. Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priest and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Chapter 26, 1 through 5, 14 through 16, 47, 57, and 59, the plot against Jesus. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priest and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. And they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or they may be a riot among the people. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? 
So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. The arrest in the garden, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Those who arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. The chief priests and the whole Sandarin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. Chapter 27, 1 through 7, 15 through 18, 20, 62 through 66. Judas returns his silver. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for the foreigners. The trial before Pilate. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas, or Jesus, who is called Christ? For, the new, for he knew it was out of the envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. The Burial of the Lord the next day, the one preparation, the one after preparation day, the chief priest and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has, ra has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the, sto on the stone and posting the guard. Chapter 28, verses 11 through 15. The guards at the tomb, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of, sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. This is the gospel of the Lord. During the early years of the congregation, a senior adult group existed known as the LV Club, Roman numerals for 55. The monthly gathering featured a dinner with entertainment or a guest speaker. A frequent speaker was a retired local high school history teacher, presenting stimulating and timely topics for discussion, enhanced by video clips show and tell objects, and a stack of books to back up information possibly heard for the first time. One of the memorable programs was on the assassination of John F. Kennedy. The majority of Americans do not believe that gunman Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone in Dallas, Texas on the 22nd of November, 1963. The communicator explored the numerous conspiracy theories about the shooting of JFK and underscored that the most important question to ask, who would most benefit 
by the removal of the president. Organized crime, Castro, dictator of Cuba, the KGB of the USSR, the CIA, big business in the war machine, Vice President Lyndon Johnson. Apply the same question to our good Lord. Who killed Jesus Christ? How would the murderer benefit from his permanent elimination? Isn't it a foregone conclusion that the appointed military governor, Pontius Pilate, rendered the verdict of the death penalty and authorized a centurion and execution squad to carry out the crucifixion? The creed finds us reciting, He was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. I submit for our reflection that a better wording is, he suffered under Annas and Caiaphas, was crucified, dead, and buried. The high priest masterminded the arrest, the rushed and rigged trials, and the death of our Savior. Disallowed by the occupying Roman government from performing capital punishment, Annas and Caiaphas used their unique status, backing Pilate into a corner, forcing him to get rid of Jesus for good. For half a century, I have delivered sermons during Lent, and I have preached on the betrayal by Judas Iscariot, the threefold denial of Simon Peter, the vacillation and moral cowardice of Pilate, the illegalities at the trial enacted by the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Council, and the brutalities of the soldiers. This may be my first message on the kingpins, Annas and Caiaphas, working behind the scenes, orchestrating the demise of the Son of God. 700 years before the birth of Christ, the Lord established a covenant with Israel selecting the tribe of Levi to serve as the priesthood. And one family, that of Aaron, the brother of Moses, to rule as the high priest. Born into the tribe of Levi made a man eligible to be a priest. Unlike the dynasty of a monarch, the oldest son of the high priest was the candidate as his successor. The job of the high priest was a lifetime office. With the Roman conquest of the Holy Land, Caesar did not like one religious ruler possessing too much influence over the population and for too long a period, and imposed term limits on the high priest. Annas was the rightful high priest, but forced to adopt the new realities. Big Daddy Annas, a schemer, had the mitre of Aaron transferred to his five sons, one at a time. And after the boys finished their term, he chose son-in-law Caiaphas. Annas, the autocrat, called the shots with everything that went on at the temple. If there had been an eighth wonder of the ancient world, the honor may have been bestowed to Herod's temple in Jerusalem. The entire economy of the holy city rotated around this religious complex. As a major tourist attraction and shrine of devotion, visitors from three continents traveled to the temple 12 months out of the year and, of course, brought their money with them. The temple was a big commercial enterprise. The Gospels make repeated mention of the chief priest. They are the retired sons of Annas, doing their father's bidding. The family of Annas operated the temple business like an ecclesiastical mafia. Did you pick up in the scripture reading the occasions the hierarchy resorted to bribery? Judas was offered 30 pieces of silver to reveal to the police the whereabouts of Jesus so they could nab him. The 30 pieces may have been 
a down payment. False witnesses were paid to lie about Christ at his trial. After the resurrection, the guards at the sepulcher reported to the chief priest the tomb was empty. Recognizing they could be in hot water, accused of a dereliction of duty. These soldiers were bribed to circulate the fabrication that during the night, while they were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the dead body of Jesus. And they were assured if Pilate was upset that they weren't awake on the night shift, don't worry, we'll grease his palm and let you guys off the hook. A Jewish rabbi, Catholic priest, and a televangelist talked among themselves what they did with the weekly contributions. The rabbi shared that he drew a chalk circle around himself, took off his hat, and held it in his hand. He threw the offerings up into the air. What landed in the circle went to the Lord, and that which fell in the hat he kept. The priest revealed that he stood inside a chalk circle, removed his hat, held it out, tossed the donations to the sky, what hit the hat he gave God, and the money in the circle he pocketed. And the money-grubbing televangelist disclosed that he too threw the collection toward heaven. And what stayed up God could have, and that which fell to the ground he laid claim. Annas and Caiaphas were running a religious racket, bilking the people of God with their hefty surcharges, translating foreign currencies in the shekels, gouging sincere worshipers with a high cost of animal sacrifices, and nickel and diming all with price tags attached to ritual practices. Christ, as the prophet of prophets, was a whistleblower turning over the tables of the money changers and driving out the merchants, charging the house of prayer, had degenerated into a den of thieves. And with his protest, our blessed Lord signed his own death warrant. With the bigwigs characterized by greed and corruption, funding their privileged and luxurious lifestyle. If you are in agreement with me, that Annas and Caiaphas are the real villains responsible more than any other persons for the arrest, unjust trials, torture, and death of Christ, then that absolves world Judaism as Christ killers. Homicide is the murder of an individual. Fracticide is a murder of a family member. Genocide is the murder of a race. A few of the early church fathers accused Jews as guilty of deicide, the murder of God. And no doubt, in our lifetime, more in the past than the present, but not altogether disappearing, is the hurtful allegation that all Jews in all times and in all places are under a curse for the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. And this anti-Semitic rhetoric resurfaces during Lent and Holy Week. According to Jewish thinkers, Matthew 27, 24, and 25 has caused more pain throughout Jewish history than any other passage in the New Testament. During the trial of Christ, the mob calling for the release of the notorious outlaw Barabbas and the impalement of our Lord, Yelled out, let his blood be upon us and our children. The consensus of interpretation is that this crowd was comprised of employees of the temple who were informed by the chief priest, if you want to keep your jobs, you are to vote for Barabbas and shout down with Jesus. Our Lord was nailed to the cross at 9 a.m., his trial before Pilate was 7 a.m. Most of Jerusalem was awakening, preparing for the day, unaware of the proceedings in Pilate's courtroom. Are all the inhabitants of Jerusalem 
accomplices in the crucifixion? Are the Jews living in the diaspora, having never heard the name of Jesus of Nazareth, a sign participation in his passion? Are all successive generations of Jews to be labeled Christ killers? This unquestioned and illogical prejudice of the past and the twisted misuse of Holy Writ has fed Christian anti-Semitism giving rise to the expulsion of Jews in England in the Middle Ages, massacres during the Crusades, and lynchings and burnings in the Spanish Inquisition. The scriptural support for unleashing discrimination and hate is a perversion of the Word of God. Can we put the rest? the faulty notion that Judaism is under a multi-generational curse, complicit with the crucifixion. Another teaching point for consideration. The endangerment of nepotism in the family of God. Funny man Robin Williams made the deduction, some men are born great, some achieve greatness, and some get it as a graduation gift. His brother is his right-hand man. He never worked before. His father earns 12 grand a year. He's paid to shut the door. His mother is a filing clerk. She cannot read or write. His sister mans the telephone. A chimp is twice as bright. A nursery rhyme. Compliments of Mad Magazine. Did you hear about the church with a slogan, nepotism? We promote family values here almost as often as we promote family members. Nepotism is widespread in government and business and lends credence to the truism, it is not what you know, but who you know. Nepotism in church world lurks with danger. Jimmy Draper, an official of the Southern Baptist Convention, identified as number one of five landmines of ministry, the common practice among those with powers and influence of favoring relatives or friends, putting yes men and women on the payroll. Dr. Robert Schuller was the granddaddy of the megachurch movement. He mentored Joel Osteen, and Rick Warren. The Hour of Power was the most watched religious broadcast on the planet. The Crystal Cathedral was the number one tourist attraction in California, surpassing the Hollywood movie studios, the Beverly Hills mansions, and Disneyland. And the Possibility Thinker had five children who apparently couldn't get along. And with all on staff and in-house fighting, combined with other factors, the church went bankrupt and dissolved. The largest church-related college in the USA is Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia, founded by Jerry Falwell. Jerry Falwell Jr. became its president and forced to step down after years of scandal, hush money, sexual escapades, hitting the bottle, and board protection. For sure, there are examples of fathers who tutored sons to continue the heritage of faithful ministry. But more often than not, protecting family interests eclipses protecting the flock. There is inadequate accountability. And because of blood connections, the incompetent and the mediocre end up with positions unable to deliver the goods. Protestants do not understand a major reason why Catholic priests are forbidden to marry. Let us imagine that St. Patrick married and had a house full of kids and held grandchildren on his knees, and, of course, gave birth to a family tree. 
these descendants upholding lineage to the name most associated with Ireland. When it would come to making decisions related to the church in the Emerald Isle, who would the people be more inclined to listen? The Pope in Rome, Italy, or the family of Patrick? How the Eastern Orthodox Church dealt with this issue of challenge to the authority of its top leadership, priests may marry, but no married man is permitted to be a bishop. And what often unfolds in Protestantism, grandfathers, fathers, sons, uncles, and nephews all enter ministry and marry the daughters of pastors. And over time, they form a block. And like a trade union, determine appointments to parishes viewed as a choice plum. And when discipline is to be administrated, they are afforded special considerations. That's how it goes. With the proliferation of autonomous congregations, more and more pastors put their children on staff grooming them for a one-day takeover of an empire. And there is no guarantee that children share their parents' spiritual DNA. Aaron, the first high priest, had two sons, Nadab and Abinahu, meriting divine correction, struck dead on the altar. Eli the priest with two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were despicable scoundrels, and they received the whammy from on high. Annas and Caiaphas did not have a calling. They had occupations, and under the guise of religion gained power and wealth. Always beware of the unconverted ministry. Last, Consider the riches of typology in the trial of Christ. Three high priests are present. Annas is the high priest emeritus. Caiaphas is the current high priest. And Jesus Christ is the supreme high priest. Annas and Caiaphas have a temporary position terminated by death. Jesus Christ is the eternal high priest. Annas and Caiaphas hold on to their titles on earth, whereas Jesus Christ is the heavenly high priest. Annas and Caiaphas acquired their office through the genealogy of Aaron. Jesus Christ is of the order of Melchizedek without a human paternity. Psalm 110 verse 4. With the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D., the high priesthood was abolished. But we have a high priest in the heavens, tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin, inviting us to come to his throne of grace and the fine grace to help in our time of need. Hebrews 4. Christ stands before the high priest Caiaphas, as the sacrificial victim. The job job description of the high priest called for him to once a year on the Day of Atonement to pray over two goats, with one set free and the other sacrificed. Barabbas represents the goat set free, Christ the scapegoat, with the sins of us all laid upon him. Isaiah 53. The high priest entered the Holy of Holies and sprinkled the blood of the unblemished lamb on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And Christ is the Lamb of God, the one full, perfect, sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. The misdoings and the evil of men set in motion a chain of events, putting our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. But ultimately... These happenings work together for the good by a divine design. With outstretched arms nailed to the cross, Jesus Christ reaches out to embrace us, saying, This is how much I love you. 
I love you so much, it hurts. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, may my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the Bring its scenes before me. Help me walk from day to day with its shadows o'er me. Near the cross I'll watch and wait. Hoping, trusting ever Till I reach the golden strand Just beyond the river